Okay, so uh, today I'm going to start with actually a, a little calculation of the density perturbations because we realized last night that nobody had quite done this in the simplest way. So uh, it's worth doing, and you know if you've seen it before, it will be quick anyway. So, um, so yeah, let me let me just do a, a quick and dirty estimate for this. Um, which um, you know is the most basic thing that we see through the CMB um, that gives us information about the times that we're talking about. So uh, what this is is basically a combination of quantum mechanical zero point energy plus the the exponential expansion that pertains during inflation. So let's just work in the slow roll case um, and consider our perturbation delta phi of our scalar inflaton field. Uh, let's Fourier transform it. Um, and in terms of the Fourier modes, we can write its equation of motion to get approximation in a flat slow roll potential in this way, um, K being the, the momentum mode here. And uh, so you can see from this equation a couple things, first of all. Um, if we look at a patch of size of the inverse Hubble rate, uh, which again is approximately constant during inflation, um, and we consider two regimes. If we start out with a mode uh, at very early times, since A of t gets very s small at early times, A of t is approximately exponentially expanding. Um, at early times, this dominates along with this term. So at early times, we are well within the Hubble patch, and we might as well be in Minkowski space. So these modes are approximately ordinary flat space Fourier modes. Um, you know, e to the up to normalization, the modes are ordinary Fourier modes. On the other hand, at very late times, uh, you can see this thing dilutes away exponentially fast. And these two terms permit a constant solution. So, um, and what we basically like to do is normalize things properly to obtain the constant solution that results when the mode has stretched to this, to this point. Later on, when the acceleration stops, um, these modes, quote unquote, re-enter the horizon and and ultimately contribute initial conditions to the uh, Boltzmann equation during, during recombination. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. I think Matthias is going to go to town on that stuff. Um, but let's just get this, this amplitude. And stop me if there are any questions about this, because we should certainly get this, this kind of thing across um, before brains and whatnot. So, um, okay, so here, here, so there's a nice little quantum mechanics estimate just, just uh, using what, what we said so far. So um, one can, of course, just solve this equation. That's one way to do it. But uh, to get physical intuition, let me actually just describe it in this, in this way in terms of quantum mechanical zero-point energy. So to do that, um, let me... Let me uh, define a variable x. So consider a patch of size L, big L, and write uh, the field in that region in terms of some quantum mechanical variable x that we can obtain just by normalizing the perturbation delta phi in this region L in this way. Um, what I mean is if you define this x, then the action for, for phi 
just becomes a quantum mechanics action with you know an x dot squared kinetic term and, and other other stuff. Um, so let's just analyze this like we would in ordinary quantum mechanics. Um, so the conjugate, so we have a, a variable x, and we have a conjugate momentum p, which is uh, you know x dot varying the action with respect to x dot, and um, in the Minkowski phase that we start in, um, this thing scales like one over L times times X itself uh, because um, it's this Fourier mode that we just mentioned. Um, and now we can use the quantum mechanical uncertainty principle um, to say that the you know delta X delta P, we're expanding around zero, um, is of order one. And putting these two together, what we're saying is x squared over L is of order one. Um, and uh, so, you know, delta x is of order uh, root L. And so delta phi um, is, is of order one over L. Um, this is not too surprising. And what that means is, um, physically, the, the momentum scale, of course, is k over a in this problem. And so uh, when the two behaviors that we just discussed cross over, um, when you know, k over a is of order of Hubble, that's the, that's the crossover between the times I called early and late in this equation. Um, when that's when at, at the crossover, at horizon crossing, um, this delta phi is, is of order Hubble. Okay. Um, and this is just showing that the physical effect is zero point energy fluctuations. Um, and then the result of the expansion is that this constant, that this uh, amplitude persists as a constant solution to the equations of motion through the rest of inflation. <coughs> so, this is basically why you compute the, the two-point function in a more you know, standard way. You get this up to some constants that I haven't kept track of. Are there any questions? OK, and then the last step is it's often expressed in terms of the curvature perturbation, the metric, which we talked about, that's just a time reparameterization. And so, um, uh, so the, the zeta variable is related to um, phi by, by just a time reparameterization. And, and that gives the answer for the curvature perturbation. is or slow roll this. This is all assuming everything's constant. Of course, there, there are slow variations of Hubble, and um, that introduces what's called a tilt in the spectrum, um, which is small. It's of, you know, uh, of order a percent. Sorry, this is a, it's cubed. Um, and um, you know, that can be computed in a similar way. Um, so so that's, that's one of the important observables that's used. Oh, and again, I should say that the, a, a completely analogous calculation for the tensor modes in terms of their polarization gives uh, an amplitude of h squared again. So, okay, so that, that was just in case uh, it was, um, in case we'd missed that. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to do is with the motivation that, that I gave last time, now start to take seriously the uh, 
use of string theory as a UV completion of gravity and field theory and inflation, again, because of the fact that in a, you know, in the standard Wilsonian sense, inflation is sensitive to quantum gravity effects, you know, for all, all models, even small field models. Um, and so let's take that seriously uh, and pursue how, how the process looks from the, from the top down, so to speak. Okay, so um, we discussed a few of the mechanisms yesterday in sort of a survey. Um, and today I'm going to start by being a little bit more systematic and discussing what we need to do to get a, a model of inflation in string theory in a way that's consistent, um, meaning that we treat all the fields consistently. We, we need to, well, we need to um, make sure that we are considering uh, the steepest direction or the fastest rolling direction, I, su I should say, in the scalar field space when we describe um, inflation in, in, a, in a theory like string theory, which has all sorts of additional degrees of freedom. Now, um, I'm well aware that most or some good fraction of you guys are not, you know, string theorists and um, may not have heard much about it at all. So I'm going to try to be very, um, to give you sort of the gist of this problem. And therefore, it's important for you to stop me if things are unclear. So just feel free to yell out if that's the case. Um, so, okay, so one of the features of string theory is that it, for at least for cosmological purposes, um, the backgrounds of string theory are higher dimensional, meaning one starts with some higher dimension bigger than, than four. Um, and one needs to so-called compactify the extra dimensions. Um, so let me just draw a cartoon of that. So um, here is a picture of the extra dimensions. Let me let me just dis let me just denote the shape of the, or the, the the compactification manifold. The internal dimensions are considered to be some some compact space, and let's uh, denote that by some x, um, which is d minus four dimensional, and the long directions here in this cartoon picture are meant to represent the four dimensions. So the idea is that the four dimensions are much larger than the internal dimensions. And um, in addition to the geometry of the compactification, there are all sorts of other uh, sources of stress energy that exist in the theory. Um, we've already drawn pictures of brains and um, higher dimensional analogs of electromagnetic fluxes or field strengths. Um, and uh, there are objects which are, I'm just going to introduce one piece of jargon here, are objects called orientifolds, which turn out to be important because <coughs> they contribute negative terms in the effective potential, um, which, which I'll mention a bit more. Um, and, you know, in addition, there are quantum mechanical effects that, that matter. So let me just, I don't know, let me just sort of give you a cartoon sketch of this. The, the, the internal manifold can have interesting topology. It can have fields turned on that stores uh, that are stress energy sources. It can have funny defects, brains, etc. cetera. Um, and for the purposes of our discussion of inflation, um, we need to understand, understand the dynamics of scalar fields that descend from this um, structure. So one thing that emerges um, 
is from this picture that I hope is intuitive in this picture is that there are many scalar fields that you get in a situation like this. Uh, one that that's particularly obvious is that the size of the internal dimensions can change, and it can change in a way that varies by the point in space in, four, in space time in four dimensions. So it's a it's a scalar field. Um, the shape of the manifold can change, and um, in a, a more interesting way, one gets additional scalar fields from um, the fact that these brains can move around, and from um, the electromagnetic fields. Um, we'll talk a lot about how they, the gauge potentials can give scalar fields, pseudo-scalar fields, um, known as axions, um, and uh, basically the, these certain of the, these scalar fields will, will, be, will be our candidate inflaton fields, and the others uh, you know, need to be understood. They need to be stabilized if they don't produce a slowly rolling um, source for inflation. Um, so, oh, okay, so, uh, and another thing to, which we'll talk about is that the, um, Geometry here, so just again, think of this as just a higher dimensional version of general relativity plus a bunch of sources. And one thing that will be quite useful is that the, um, there can be redshifting effects. Uh, so um, I think I did this yesterday, but let me write down here with that in mind a kind of relatively general expression for the, the geometry that we're talking about. So um, maybe I should call this y just to be, make the notation as consistent as possible. So we have this internal space y which with coordinates y in this metric that describes uh, the full d-dimensional space. And here's the 4D metric, which is approximately to sitter during our inflationary phase. And in general, the um, metric can have this y-dependent variation consistently with the de Sitter symmetries in this part of the metric. And that's important because this can lead to strong redshifting effects as g naught naught, if e to the a here is, is small, g naught naught in particular can become very small. And this is a important for reasons that we'll get to, but it, it introduces naturally small energy scales into the problem. Okay. Um, so this is quite complicated. Um, let me just sketch for you the, so, so the problem is conceptually not that difficult. It's how do you start from a higher dimensional Einstein theory plus all these sources, reduce it, and get a potential energy and kinetic terms for these scalar fields, and how do they behave? Okay, that conceptually it's not a difficult question. Um, technically, it is a difficult question. And um, so, but let me just continue and give you a bit more of the intuition for how it works. Okay, so, so, um, so 
So the effect of action, um, just in just in the top dimension to begin with, um, is and just focusing on terms that will descend to potential energy terms. Um, when we go down to four dimensions, is of this form. And what I'm going to do is just kind of give you a sense of what the different features of the compactification contribute in terms of potential energy. Um, Okay, so what I've written here, again, is uh, an expression for how the different kinds of ingredients that we, that we talked about up, up there um, contribute to the effective action and, and in a way that will descend to an effective potential. And uh, this phi that I've written is a scalar field that's related to the interaction strength of strings, um, so the string coupling is itself a scalar field. It can vary in space-time. And um, and um, turns out, well, it makes sense if you think about the way couplings appear in effective actions, that it sits uh, here in this position in the action. And then um, various contributions to the potential appear. So one of them is hopefully uh, clear um, immediately, and that's the higher dimensional Einstein term. So this is just gravity. Oops. And it means that on a generic manifold, which is curved, there will be a contribution to the effective potential. The sign is such that if the curvature is negative, the potential is positive. If it's zero, it's flat, and if it's uh, a positively curved internal space, or internal space the potential is, is negative from that. Um, this first term appears when we consider uh, backgrounds of string theory that are not super symmetric. Um, in, if you pick, so let me just specialize this. If you pick, pick the total dimension to be 10, then there's a effective uh, supersymmetry at low energies in string theory. And um, this term in the potential energy goes to zero, uh, but more generally it's there. Um, these next terms describe the contributions of brains and then these funny things that I called orientifolds. Um, so brains hopefully are intuitive. They're localized sources of energy um, and hence they contribute to the effect of potential in a way that it uh, depends on how much they're localized. So that's what this d delta function describes, is um, a tension, a brain tension, which is their energy density, times a delta function showing, you know, describing how localized they are and what dimensions they're localized. Um, you know, generally they can be wrapped on complicated sub-manifolds of the internal dimensions, um, but this is the basic idea. Now, the uh, interesting thing about these quote unquote orientifolds is that they contribute negative uh, tension, um, and in that way they behave like brains with negative mass, but in fact 
it's important that they don't really behave like brains with negative mass. If there were such things, this theory would be very unstable. Um, one could pair produce more and more negative energy objects and uh, that would be a runaway instability. These objects are more subtle than that and I really don't have, um, it's really, we don't have time to do a, a class on perturbative string theory now, but what uh, one feature of these makes clear how, how different they are, I think. So these are obtained by a certain projection of the space-time coordinates along with a, an action on the, on the string itself. Um, the projection on the space-time coordinates is basically a reflection, so you have some object um, and uh, the, the, there's a projection reflecting coordinates um, by 180 degrees around the object, um, reflecting all of the transverse coordinates. So, and as a result of that, um, the, the asymptotic uh, structure of the space is modified by these, these objects. Um, they're not a small perturbation. They're not a test object that can be proliferated and produced um, in, in some kind of runaway instability. They're more, they're just, they're defects which make a big uh, impact on the asymptotics of the space. And uh, if you play around with it, you'll see that you can't do this arbitrarily many ways. So um, they're important because of something that we'll get to shortly, which is why I'm belaboring this, but um, anyway, uh, there's that term. That's probably the most subtle term that we'll discuss. And then there are these terms I've written here. So these H's and F's are the higher dimensional uh, analogs of electromagnetic fields. Um, so, you know, remember in ordinary electromagnetism, you have field strengths, which are the uh, derivatives of potential terms. Um, and all we're doing is a higher dimensional analog of that here. Uh, and this P determines how many indices the things have. So in, um, uh, in the usual case that you're familiar with, um, you have uh, this, you know, two index object. Um, and, in higher, and in higher dimensions, one finds generalizations of this with more indices. Um, so basically one adds indices to the potential and hence to the field strength. So um, let me just Let me just do that. Um, so then you have, you know, an epsilon symbol. Uh, in other words, th this thing is totally anti-symmetrized, and you get a higher dimensional analog of electromagnetism with with potential fields that are analogous to the vector potential of electromagnetism and with field strengths that contribute energy. So this is like, these terms are like the E squared, in terms of energies are like E squared plus B squared um, that you're familiar with in electromagnetism. Yeah? Okay, so. So I was saying in normal electromagnetism, you have, you have F mu nu, which is, And it's the fancy way of describing this is as the uh, derivative, the uh, as d of some potential field, and the indices are again mu nu, and um, one can just proliferate the indices. So one can consider a potential term with, you know, with more legs, more indices, and a, and a uh, field strength which is an anti-symmetrized derivative with uh, all of the potential fields. Um, so 
Um, yeah, so we just can express that as f mu 1 to mu p um, is a totally anti-symmetrized derivative B mu two, A mu one, et cetera. So the whole the whole right hand side is totally anti symmetrized. Um, is that visible now? Yeah. Okay. Um, now there's yet another twist to the story, which is hopefully the last thing I just have to tell you, which is, which, but which is very interesting and important, um, which is to do with this twiddle here on this on the field strength that I've written. Um, so by the way, there are two different kinds of, of these which couple differently to the string coupling. Um, this, this guy, in the language that we were just describing, is D of a two-form potential field that's commonly called B. Um, and uh, these F twiddles are actually what we just described here, F plus, um, so let me, plus, so for a given P, these twiddles are FP plus FP minus 2 uh, with an anti-symmetrized product with um, this B2 field, potential field, um, that I just mentioned. Uh, so the structure of this is actually very pretty if you get into it. For now, you can just trust me that this is what you obtain if you take strings and compute their scattering amplitudes and figure out what effective action would produce those scattering amplitudes. And if you do that, you get this mess. Um, on the problems, you'll play a bit with the gauge transformation structure of this. So, you know, in electromagnetism, you have a gauge invariant like this, um, which the field strength is invariant under. And in this kind of theory, with these generalized field strengths, um, you might wonder what happens to the gauge transformation of B, under which B goes to B plus D of some one form. And the answer is F, uh, A, P minus 1 here has to transform such that such a, this whole quantity is gauge invariant. And that all works. So the general principles that you're used to from electromagnetism, that you have field strengths, which are gauge invariant quantities, which are usefully expressed in terms of gauge potentials, um, appears also in this theory. Um, and the reason, I, again, I'm bringing this up for, for what I think you'll agree is a good reason, um, uh, because what is going to happen is that these, these fields, for example, and generally the potential fields uh, that we've described here are going to give rise to, to axions um, when we reduce to four dimensions. Um, are there, does anyone want to ask a question about this structure? Okay. Please. <laughs> what about the structure of it? Wait, say again? No, I, mean, I thought that you wanted uh, to, to add something. To oh, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, I just, I want, um, no, no, I didn't mean that there was a question that I was fishing for. It just, this is a lot to absorb in one one step, so I'm just pausing. Yeah. Why is the string coupling Well, it does. So it's it's sitting here. Oh, so why are they coupled differently? Why are they coupled differently? Um, for now, just take this as a result of the calculation that I just described in words. You take strings, you scatter them, you get the amplitudes for that. You figure out what action would produce the same amplitudes, and that gives this answer. Um, When you start to consider the fancy dualities that string theorists go on about, you'll, you, you see that it all 
happens for more of a reason than I just gave, but uh, yeah, um, I'm afraid I can't answer the why question for that in, in, in uh, short order, but it is a good question. Any other, yeah? Well, it ha it's so it's a it's an anti-symmetric two by two. I mean, it's, it's an anti-symmetric matrix, um, uh, and in four dimensions, it's it's equivalent to a scalar field. Um, but in higher dimensions, it you know it's got more degrees of freedom. It's an anti-symmetric matrix, and it's subject to a gauge transformation of this kind. Um, Yeah. Why did you why did you write work in an open stack? Ah, you're right, you're right about that. You are right about that. Um, you're right, I was jumping jumping the gun on that. Yeah, that, that all comes from from the curvature. Okay. Any any good good? Someone's paying attention? Any yeah. Yeah, so um, you may not have seen this before because people often assume that they want uh, low energy supersymmetry. And if you, if you want to consider that sort of model, you need to choose d equals 10, and then this term is 0. Um, however, we are interested in potential energy. We're going to add you know, generic contributions from these other sources of stress energy, like fluxes, et cetera. And so logically, it doesn't seem to me uh, natural to, from the start, restrict to d equals t 10, although, you know, we, we, we can do that for simplicity. Anyway, the, the statement is that in any other dimension besides the critical dimension, there is a tree-level potential energy um, in the d-dimensional theory. And so, you know, there isn't then a flat space-time solution of the theory because there's this potential energy. But there are perfectly good solutions describing rolling scalar fields. Um, in those dimensions. So again, if you do this, this calculation of uh, you know, string interactions, you, you, you pick out, you, you see that this term is there in general. But yeah. In four dimensions. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is up in D dimensions. So, so the way that we get to flat space in the, in the landscape, you know, maybe ultimately there will be a, a different answer to this, but in the landscape, the way it works is, you have po positive contributions, you have negative contributions, and they're tuned against each other to give. So you, you, you need positive terms, you need negative terms, and yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's not that you want, that you have any reason to want to start near flat space in the higher dimension. Aside from supersymmetry, supersymmetry is a very nice idea. It might be, you know, might be seen, uh, in which case that would have been a good choice. But a priori, just logically, there's, nothing uh, forcing this choice, nor is there anything forcing one to take this, the internal dimensions to be Ricci flat, which is, the, 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 uh, which is a, a similar assumption that people often make. Um, instead, you know, the internal dimensions can, are generically, should be expected to be curved, and that also gives a contribution to the potential from, from here. Um, in any case, you know, we have all these other sources that will contribute potential energy. So, um, yeah. How do you get an F dual for the axion term? Say again? How do you get an F dual for the axion term? An F dual for the axion term. An F dual for Not only the axion axion, but F dual also. Oh, yeah, yeah. These, these axions, uh, so yeah, actually, yes, indeed, I haven't written I haven't written all that. There are other terms. So there are terms. Um, there are terms of the form a wedge f wedge. F, you know, in terms of this form. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah. These these terms are are also present in the effective action. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to, so if we if we work in four dimensions, um, this thing is so. D of it is a three form. So um, you can, if you're familiar with this language, DB is a three form. And in four dimensions, if you take the dual, that's uh, the, the derivative of a scalar field. Um, 
And so it's one scalar degree of freedom in four dimensions. In higher dimensions, it has more degrees of freedom. We'll talk about where, how we get axions um, from this in a little bit more detail later. Yeah? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it proliferates, it, it, yeah. Yeah, in fact, the, the number of these guys grows exponentially. So the number of axions actually grows exponentially in, in dimension for what it's worth, yeah. Like there is no, everything is the same, I, I go on with the, with the, the, the yeah, the, many of the features are, are similar. What you, you, you just, you don't have supersymmetry. Um, you, you do in, in sort of, at a very high scale, but you don't have it at low energies. Now, the, one of the reasons supersymmetry is useful is for theoretical control of calculations that are pushed to strong coupling. Um, but here, in this kind of model building, we need not go there. I mean, there's, this is quite prosaic in a certain sense. We're looking for perturbative control of the terms in the effective theory. And uh, for that purpose in itself, we, supersymmetry is not a theoretical requirement. It's been extremely useful in the field to push to strong coupling and learn, learn about strong coupling physics. Um, but, okay, um, but also, you know, nature doesn't, doesn't go along with what theorists find convenient necessarily, so I think it's important to have the big picture of what is, you know, what does the theory really require, and then, you know, one can make model building choices like pick supersymmetry and turn off these terms or, you know, whatever you like to do, um, but it's important, I think, to have the perspective of what's, what's really uh, the general story. Um, I will soon actually make that choice for simplicity, but I, I want you to know that it's very much a choice. Okay, any other questions? Okay, um, so we're interested in the, in inflationary dynamics, so, um, the first question you might ask, given this picture, is, okay, there are these scalar fields, like the overall size of the space, and now, um, you know, this thing I told you is a scalar describing the interaction strength of the strings, which appears in the action. So what about those scalar fields? Can those give a, a flat potential or more generally a slowly changing potential? Um, and the answer to that is, is no, it's a, very, it's a fairly simple, uh, calculation. Um, the, so to, to get there, we need to start with this action and dimensionally reduce to four dimensions. So just, oops. Um, and, and keep the, the scalar fields that, you know, such as the overall volume and other uh, scalar field modes, um, and describe them as, as such, as scalar fields in four dimensions. Um, so uh, there's a slightly, there's a simple but important little technical step here, um, which we want to do, which is to go to um, what's called Einstein frame in four dimensions. So before getting to the potential energy, let's talk about the Einstein term, um, which has contributions from all the dimensions, and let's uh, decompose it into the four dimensions and the rest of the dimensions. So when we integrate over the extra dimensions, we get a factor of the volume of the extra dimensions times this inverse string coupling squared times the, the Einstein term in four dimensions. So the action in 4D in the, what's called the string frame that we started with, that we get just by, just by reducing this action, has an Einstein term um, which goes like the volume of our internal space Y divided by G string squared. I'm not gonna put in the correct dimension full factors. Um, and the four dimensional part of the curvature. So, um, 
let's see if this is, so uh, we have a D4X here, and this alpha prime is the basic uh, en tension scale of the string. So it's, a, it's an energy squared scale in string theory. Um, and it's distinct from the Planck mass scale, uh, which we can basically see here. So this, this um, combination is what uh, scales like the, the Planck mass squared, appearing in front of the Einstein term in the four-dimensional gravity action. Um, but it's got this scalar field dependence still infecting it, since, as we keep saying, these scalars like phi and the volume are these the quantities like the volume and, and phi are, are dynamical scalar fields. So um, in order to remove the scalar field dependence from the action, that requires making a, a rescaling of the metric. Um, so I need to mention that or else, because it leads to a simple physical Result. So, um, what is written next to oh, vol volume? Volume, yeah, vol is volume. Okay, so, um, so, so we we need to uh, make a transformation of the frame. So we need to rescale the metric. So I, I put a parenthesis S to denote this quote unquote string frame, the, the, just the components of the metric in D dimensions that reduce to 40. Um, and we need to rescale that um, by something to remove the scalar field dependence in, in the action. And um, if you just take into account the fact that the square root of the determinant um, goes like the lower metric squared in four dimensions, and the curvature net squares like one power of g upper, and you just ask, what do you need to do to remove the scalar field dependence? The um, answer is this. We want to define an Einstein metric with two lower indices, which is um, the volume over g string squared times the, the string metric. Um, and if you do that, then um, that is the thing that correctly removes scalar field dependence. from the Einstein term. The reason for doing this is that otherwise when you solve the coupled equations of motion of the scalars and the, and the gravitational field, you obtain, you, you, it, it's, uh, they get coupled in a way that's you know, not convenient for solving them and, and that doesn't reduce to what you're used to working with in ordinary cosmological calculations. So, um, so technically that's one reason to do this. And then there's an important physical result to this, uh, which is, which is uh, now going to become clear. So as we reduce this action to four dimensions, now focusing on the terms that are going to become potential energy terms, um, we have this string metric appearing here and uh, since the square root of the determinant scales like two powers of g, g lower, um, that means that to write it in terms of the Einstein metric, uh, the square root of the determinant will give us a factor of g strings to the fourth over volume squared in front of every term in the potential. Um, so let me... And, and the effect of that is going to be to make all of the sources of, of stress energy, all of them, including this d minus 10, et cetera, dilute as we go out to large volume and weak coupling. So 
sorry, just one sec. What was the question? The indices on the, the indices are mu nu. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just indicating whether they're lowered or uppered. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're not written, they're just indicating, <laughs> they're, they're not actually, oh. you're not missing anything. I just wrote dots to indicate whether they're lower metric components or upper metric components. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Any other? What is the GS? So GS is, so it's, it's, the, it's the coupling. So. Um, let me be a le less cryptic about it. So you're used to, in thinking about field theories, um, you know, you'll, you'll have some, some action, like for Yang-Mills theory, which has a coupling in front of it. That's what this is for strings. Um, and the, the thing is that in string theory, it's a, it's a scalar field, it's not just a parameter. Um, so it, it, gov it governs the interact, it governs the, it comes with every vertex and every interaction vertex of, of strings. Well, that, that was just dimensional analysis. In fact, I should have put it here, and I already, sorry, I should call it, uh, after I was harping on the dimensions, it's, it's um, alpha prime to the d minus two over two, um, is what I really should write. It's just a, it, it, uh, this, this action needs to be dimensionless. Um, the curvature has dimension two in all dimensions, and so alpha prime has dimensions of length squared, so. It's alpha prime to four in 10 dimensions. <coughs> Any other questions? The term dimension actually is derived in almost applied space. How can we use it in cosmology? Ah, well, that's okay. That's a, that's a fair question. Um, for, so this one actually is derived in a, in a complete string theory. That is one, uh, this is beyond the scope of this class, but. Um, the solution that you get from this term involves the dilaton rolling in a certain way, which is described by an exact solution of the, of the full you know, classical string theory. So it's a good question, even though the time derivatives or the gradients, depending on whether you're above or below the, the critical dimension, are become of order the string tension scale, it turns out that it's possible to treat that, that it's a, it's a solution that's essentially as simple as flat space. Um, now, uh, you know, more generally, we are just using ordinary effective field theory. So we derive the action around flat space, so, you know, something you can do in GR also. And then from that, we deduce a covariant form of the action, and then we apply it in, in other solutions. It, it certainly breaks down at very, you know, near singularity. This, this description breaks down near singularities and other extreme environments. But here we're staying in, you know, a, a rather weakly curved, um, set of solutions. Remember, everything about these inflationary solutions is well below the Planck scale. Um, it's the large time scale that's required that makes it sensitive to Planck suppressed operators. It's not that we're going up to Planck energy densities or anywhere near that. It's the, it's the long extent of the process that makes it sensitive. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? Right, so if you don't, if you do d-dimensional string theory and you don't do, there's, you don't encounter the EGS structure vector? No, they, they don't, they don't all have tachyons. There's some of them don't, right? They're well, so, so it, it's like, that much is like, that, that, that much has nothing to do with dimension, actually. There are, there are theories which have instabilities and other theories which don't, and that's true in, in all, in, you know, both for the critical theory and for higher dimensional theories. This is, this is a red herring. There, there are, Non tachyonic theories. That's right, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think you always need to use the ones that don't have tachyons, right? Well, it depends what you depends what you well, depends what you're interested in, but yeah, in general, um, <coughs> sometimes tachyons are good. If you want superconductivity, tachyons are good. The Higgs is a tachyon, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, any, anyway, um, this is getting a little far afield. But was there another question? No, I was just uh, I mean, he's been he's been answering that with something too easy. He's kind of view of the mode or something just to any kind of tachyon possibility. Well, the thing to do just okay. The thing to do, like in the critical dimensions, if you want to avoid tachyons, is make a, an appropriate projection that projects them out. Now, Hubble expansion in, leads to a shift in the effective mass squared of mode because of the time dependence, which is interesting. So there's a, 
there's a shift in the effect of mass. Just, just ordinary Hubble expansion leads to a tachyonic shift in the mass squared of, a, of the scalar fields. Um, but those are not, uh, those don't destabilize the system. They, when they turn on, their effects are subdominant to the ambient expansion. And so we sometimes call those pseudo tachyons. And th those are generally there in a cosmological, uh, those are much more generically there. Um, but, they, but they're harmless, mostly harmless. Any other questions? Yeah. You wanted to ask? Where is he? Right there. Here? Yes. Yeah. What exactly is that? that is just the descendant of the one in D dimensions. Um, so the, the one in D dimensions. So just for simplicity, let's think about a product space of four dimensions times internal dimensions with no off diagonal modes. This is just for simplicity. Then the square root of the determinant of the metric factorizes into the one in four dimensions, which I was calling with a substring over there because we wanted to change its frame. And then the, the one in um, higher dimensions, um, which, came, which became the, the volume factor here. So that, that's, where, that's, where the, that, that's where these two factors came from. Any other uh, discussion? OK. Um, now where were, oh yeah. So, so yeah, so this, had a, this, this has a physical point as well, which is now going to come up. So the, um, the potential terms which we get from this reduction, switching the frame in the way we just described, um, give us uh, a factor of, um, because of the square root of the determinant of the metric, um, we, we get a factor of g string squared over volume squared. Um, this is from rescaling the square root of the determinant of the metric, which again scaled like two inverse powers of uh, the, t sorry, two, two powers of the, of the lowered metric times the thing you just get by naively dimensionally reducing um, this, these terms. So let's just do, um, so let me, let me just call the thing you get by naively, by just taking those terms and reducing them v hat, and just let me, to make this concrete, let me just do one, one of the terms for, for fun. Let's say we do the curvature term. So um, the curvature term, if we, if we consider now the components of curvature from the internal dimensions and we reduce them, well, let, let's just think about a constant curvature space, um, a sphere, a torus, which has zero curvature, or a hyperbolic space, which has negative curvature. Um, those, if they have non-zero curvature, have a v hat in the language I'm talking about, which scales like with some sign, one over the size of the, one over the curvature radius squared of the internal dimensions times the volume um, over g string squared. Um, so uh, the volume again comes, the volume over g string squared comes from these factors. The curvature is here and again, this first factor is the Einstein frame conversion. So, um, so the upshot of this is that because of this large power of g squared over volume, um, as we go to large radius or weak coupling in this theory, um, the terms in the potential energy all go off to zero from above or below depending on the sign, in this case the sign of the curvature. Um, in these other cases, the sign of the brain or orientifold tension, um, and in this case, the question of which way you left the critical dimension. So the sign can vary, but the, the general feature that we see from this is that all of the sources of stress energy dilute to zero as, the, as we go to large radius and weak coupling. Um, so large radius and weak coupling are the place where we have computational control. Um, and uh, so we want to work somewhere around there. 
but we need to, but uh, for one thing, there's no such thing as a hard cosmological term that we get in the four-dimensional theory. We can't just put in a lambda in the four-dimensional theory and, um, and describe absolutely stable the sitter space, for example. Instead, we have you know, this, this feature that as we go out and coupling and inverse radii and so on, um, as we, uh, you know, as we go back to weak coupling and large radius, we, we, we go back to zero potential energy. Um, so in this language, by the way, the this, this sort of simplest solutions people have found are these anti de Sitter solutions where you have um, a positively curved internal space and then flux, and you find a minimum here. Um, and in de Sitter, we need instead at least uh, you know, a three-term structure to get us uh, above zero in potential energy. Um, and by the way, that is also you know, why these so-called orientifolds are so important, is because they naturally produce terms that can give this negative dip in the potential um, at, at an order in the expansion in couplings and inverse radii that uh, that uh, produces this kind of solution. Um, so to get back to inflation, let's ask what uh, happens with the scalar fields like the ones we've kind of been focusing on here, the size of, size of the internal dimensions, let's just say it's isotropic so it has some overall size L, or the string coupling, um, which we keep saying is a scalar field. So. One question you might ask is, as you roll in this direction, could you be inflating? Um, and the answer to that is, is no. Uh, so um, <clears throat> so I actually put this as an exercise. And I, you know, it's, it's, again, conceptually a simple question um, to take the metric so to do a, do a compactification of this kind and consider basically any of these sources by themselves, let's say ones that give a positive contribution to the potential, um, say negative curvature, d greater than 10, or fluxes. And if you do that and you um, canonically normalize the scalar fields and everything to, to compute the, the action for, for these for these modes, um, you find that the, for example, um, again, in the 4D Einstein frame, uh, the potential energy for the, let's say for the, um, so let, let me write actually, we already said G string goes like E to the phi. Um, and let's write 1 over L as e to the minus sigma. Um, let me actually canonically normalize these scalar fields. Um, and you find that the uh, structure of the potential energy in these directions is, is you know, some, some constant number times exponentials in the canonical fields. Um, with the, the dimensions made up in the exponent by the Planck scale, um, with a coefficient here um, in, the numer in, the, in the exponent that doesn't support slow roll inflation. So um, again, I'm not quite working this all out for you, but it, uh, it's a simple matter of taking some internal manifold, say, um, writing the metric in terms of um, its size, parameterizing that uh, to begin with, if you like, as the exponential of some field sigma. And um, you find that the potential terms are si sigma or, or phi sub c here for canonical. And you find that the, with, um, having chosen this field to have a canonical kinetic term, the potential energy is exponential. You know, the sign can be plus or minus depending on the signs of those contributions that we talked about. 
And the, the coefficient of the exponent is, is not parametrically small. It does not support inflation. You're also rolling toward very big dimensions, so you might have problems exiting to a, to a reasonable endpoint, even if it had inflated. By the way, another thing to say about this uh, at this point is, it sh this shows already that large field strengths are perfect, you know, are, are well well known in, in string theory. Um, going out to large radius or going out to weak string coupling is an infinite uh, distance in field strength, and you know, many Planck units are available, um, but they're just not flat enough. They're not, um, okay. So, uh, uh, well, so, did I do this right? So as L gets large, I, I'm going towards zero here, so that, that's why I drew it this way. Um, Yeah, yeah, okay, so, so sigma, you can change its sign if you want to, it, it, it doesn't matter. I wrote this as a function of L, so, so this picture is as a function of G string or one over L. Um, but, the, but what I was saying about the sigma here is just that it turns out that the canonically normalized scalar field corresponding to the size L is actually the log of L, um, and um, because of that, when we get, contributions to the scalar potential that have these factors of one over L to some power, um, it means that the actual potential as a function of the canonical field is exponential. Um, and again, this is something that's useful to, to play with yourself, which you'll do if you do the problems. Um, okay. okay, so, so far the upshot is there's a lot of degrees of freedom in the um, UV completion of gravity that string theory provides involving these horrible compactifications. Um, things like the overall size and the string coupling uh, need to be stabilized rather than being used for inflation themselves because they don't work for inflation. They, they're running off to a, an extreme limit anyway and um, so uh, one needs to instead arrange a, a set of terms using these kinds of ingredients to produce at least a metastable minimum of the potential um, in all directions that are not candidate in photon directions. Okay, so I'm not going to go on about this much more for these lectures, although later when we do one of the kinds of inflation, I'll talk a bit more about the supersymmetric choice. Um, but uh, what we'll, we'll move toward is identifying the scalar fields among the ones we've started to talk about, which are good candidates for inflation. So I've already anticipated for you that axions are going to do a good job, um, and I'll explain that quite a bit more. Uh, also, these brains can move. so. The positions of brains give us scalars. And you can imagine that in a construction where you stabilize the dangerous directions using strong enough uh, of these sources, there, you, know, you can maybe add some little brain somewhere that doesn't have, which is subdominant in its uh, contribution to the energy sources can move around and, well, maybe that would have a, 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 a controllable inflationary dynamics. So in other words, um, we kind of sometimes say this as the, the leftovers of moduli stabilization, these scalars are called moduli, um, can, can, you know, can be good candidate in photons. So fields like axions, which have an underlying periodicity and don't run off to extreme places and perhaps, <coughs> You know, light brains inside a, a, a big, you know, uh, manifold um, could could also provide such candidates. There's one more thing about the general structure though, that I want to that I want to cover, which is this 
notion of warping that I keep mentioning. So I described it up there, and, and let me just um, finish the thought, because as I mentioned earlier, it's a very nice natural source of low energy scales. So we'll want, we'll want to have that in mind as well. Okay, so the last topic for, for today will be this topic of, that's related to compactifications also, but um, but in terms of the, the model building and naturalness ideas we've been talking about has to do with getting uh, small energy scales in a natural way through exponential effects. So. Um, in gauge theory, uh, hopefully you're familiar with the notion of dimensional transmutation, um, which produces exponentially small scales as a function of the underlying coupling in the, in the effective action. Things like instantons, tunneling of events, um, give exponentially small contributions to the effective theory. And, well, Essentially, via the ADS-CFT correspondence, there's a, there's a very nice geometrical version of this. Um, um, so let me just describe it as a geometrical dual. Um, it doesn't, you know, if you're not comfortable with the duality, never mind. It, we'll just get this directly from gravity. And the idea is that one can obtain a, a, a similar exponentially suppressed set of energy scales through um, gravitational redshift. So you've seen the, the metric of ADS space a number of times. I'm going to write it in here in the way that makes the, this exponential effect most you know, immediately clear. Um, so If you, you know, for, for a second, uh, just consider a slice of anti de Sitter space in five dimensions um, with a, with, which is a warped product of a, of a line, the z direction, with four dimensions, which I've just taken to be Minkowski space. And um, in terms of the proper distance down the fifth direction, z, you have exponential redshifting, exponential warping. So if you know, this curvature scale is not, you know, this curvature scale doesn't need to be terribly large in order to produce a, um, a, uh, a small scale um, through through this redshifting effect. Um, so as we, as we sketched yesterday in, in sort of cartoons, um, well, okay, so as I said ab above, um, the most general metric of a compactification um, along these y directions will include some possibility of warping uh, this factor e to the 2a of y multiplying the four-dimensional metric. Uh, this respects all the symmetries of the problem and so should be included as, the, as a generic possibility. Um, so furthermore, we, we know through the, I mean, let, let's do use intuition from the ADS-CFT correspondence where geometry like this is dual to gauge theory effects like this and um, having 
you know, strongly coupled gauge theories with dimensional transmutation is, um, you know, a very reasonable and standard possibility. Um, and in a compactification, that, that gets geometrized through the ADS-CFT duality uh, to give regions which are highly warped. So um, to make this clear, I should probably include a term for the rest of the dimensions. But the idea, again, is that there's some ADS, some warped region, some redshifted region that is approximately well described by ADS. There are interesting generalizations that describe confinement in a, in a slightly different uh, warping function than this, but this is the basic idea. Um, and again, just to make this clear, the energy scales are given by the redshift factor root g naught naught times uh, proper energies. So, you know, something, say up here, so, so, so this picture is describing uh, as, as, so here, z is going to infinity, and the redshifting is getting very strong, so energies are very low here and high up here in the bulk of the compactification. So something like a, a heavy fundamental string or cosmic string in this region becomes very light down in this region. Um, and um, similarly, sources of potential energy like brains that are wrapped on some cycle or defects or whatever, the, the kinds of things that we were talking about up there, become redshifted if they sit instead in one of these highly, highly warped regions. Um, and you know, not only do they become redshifted, but it's, it's really a very natural effect. It's an effect where one doesn't need to put in large numbers to get out a large hierarchy. One puts in a modest number, and one gets an exponential hierarchy in scales. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so um, what to say about this? So again, th there, there's, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a power law effect, a, a little bit of a power law tune to make this curvature radius bigger than the fundamental scales of the of the problem. Um, but given that, it's uh, quite generic to get this kind of warped geometry. Um, yeah, I'd, there's probably a better way to say this than I'm giving. Um, but again, in gauge theory, it's a very familiar thing. If you have a strongly coupled gauge theory, it doesn't even have to be a large end theory. Um, you obtain uh, exponentially small effects from, you know, from instantons and other non-perturbative physics in the, in the field theory. And so, I mean, this, this is really just a generalization. This is really just an ADS-CFT dual of that phenomenon. Um, so, um, you know, when one model builds just in field theory, uh, it is possible, particularly people have done this in supersymmetric theories, to, to control the, these non-perturbative effects and show, you know, that they couple to the, the physics that you're interested in modeling in such a way to produce a, a low energy scale. Um, um, but again, the, the, in both cases, the point is one is one doesn't need to make a gigantic tune of, of, the, of the basic coupling, or in this case, the basic length scale, in order to get an exponentially strong effect. Um, I don't know. We, we can talk about it a bit more, um, if because because I, I I think you're getting at an interesting question, maybe, which is which is. Um, what happens? So, in order for exponential effects to dominate, other other perturbative effects need to, to need to not be there, and you know, the, the you might wonder what what special choices have been made to achieve that. In some cases, the the answer to that is supersymmetry. Um, so, that's a choice of a symmetry principle, which can give quite naturally situations where perturbative effects are just zero, and this is the leading sort of thing that happens. Um, but then you can well ask, well, how big of a specialization did I make to make that choice of this symmetry principle? 
And that's, I think, a serious question. I mean, if, if you look from the top down at these compactifications, almost every manifold is curved. And the supersymmetric choice is to choose a Ricci flat manifold, a manifold which, which is uncurved. And, you know, um, so if you think of just two dimensional manifolds, you have a sphere which is positively curved. That's the thing that gives you things like ADS CFT. You have a torus which is flat, which is the analog of Calabia manifolds. And then you have an infinite sequence of curved manifolds which are negatively curved. And, and so making the supersymmetric choice is choosing this over all of these. So it's, it's a serious question. <laughs> but uh, if you make such, such choices, then, then you can obtain these, these uh, exponentially small scales in a, in a way that is natural, again, according to the Wilsonian notion of, of naturalness. OK, so this, I think, is a, is a good stopping point, point for today. And, and then tomorrow, we'll get, we'll get into the, the nice uh, scalars that can give inflation in a natural way. Um,